Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, just want to introduce myself. My name is Jeremy Martinez, and my wife Amber and I, we lead the Connection class here at Calvary. And I uh, just want to thank you for allowing us to teach a Sunday school lesson virtually. I uh, just want to use this opportunity uh, and this platform to really encourage you, if you're not coming to a Sunday school class right now, um, I just want to encourage you to, to begin to find a Sunday school class here at Calvary. And, and, and you really get the benefit of seeing the virtual Sunday school uh uh, lessons and teachers um, so just know there's diversity within our Sunday school classes here at Calvary and I just want to encourage you to, to find one you'll be discipled you'll be loved on um, you'll find a, a church family within our Sunday school classes we don't just meet to get a head knowledge of who God is uh, but we meet so that we can apply God's Word to our life and I just want to encourage you to, to find a Sunday school class if you're not coming to one currently um, we're going to be in, in uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12 this morning. Uh, the title of, of the lesson is The Truth of the Resurrection. Uh, this is the last week of the lesson uh, in the, in the uh, curriculum of, of 40 days to Easter. Um, so Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Again, the title is The Truth of the Resurrection. I want to open us up in a word of prayer, um, and then we'll kind of talk about the introduction and then get into the scripture this morning. So. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for allowing us uh, to, to read your word openly and freely, Lord. We ask that as we're reading the, uh, Luke chapter 4 this morning, that your word uh, teaches us and corrects us, Father, and that fills us with joy and excitement. I pray that we understand that the resurrection is, is uh, full of proof and evidence, Father, that you truly did raise Jesus from the dead. And I pray that we use that evidence as we're ministering throughout our community, Father. And I pray that your word teaches us this morning. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 1 through 12, if you want to kind of jump to, to that uh, piece of Scripture in your Bible, I just want to talk uh, about a few foundations and lay down a few uh, 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 foundations before we start the lesson. Is, is really, as Amber and I were, were talking and kind of studying uh, this week um, over Luke chapter 24, we begin to ask ourselves one of the questions is, is why is it important for us uh, to, to study the resurrection? And, and is it important for us to understand and believe the resurrection is true? Um, and if it's important, why is it important? And I just wanted to talk about that uh, first and foremost is that it's absolutely paramount and focal for us as, as Christians to understand the resurrection is true. Um, there's evidences in all four of the Gospels that, that the resurrection is true um, and that it's crucial for our salvation. I want to look at a couple of pieces of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul begins speaking about the resurrection, and he says that the, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, that neither will we. Apart from Christ's resurrection, we won't have salvation. And that's what Paul clearly points to. Uh, he also talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, is that, that if, if Christ uh, didn't rise from the dead, that we're false teachers of God, that we're liars of God, that Christ didn't rise from the dead, that everything we do is in vain. So it's absolutely crucial that we understand the resurrection, that we know that God did raise Jesus from the dead, um, and that's crucial to our salvation. Also, Romans chapter uh, 10, verse 9 uh, it's, a, it's a verse that we're all pretty familiar with, and it says that, that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. That if God raised Jesus from the dead and we believe that and make Jesus Lord of our life, we will be saved. So it's absolutely important that we understand that Jesus is Lord and that God did raise Him from the dead. So we need to study the, the resurrection. We don't need to get complacent with it um, and just think that we talk about it on Resurrection uh, Sunday and that's the only time we think about it. We need to think about it every day as Christians and as believers. Um, another thing we need to talk about is, is uh, looking at Luke chapter 24, uh, it's full of skepticism. It's full of doubt. And it's even full of unbelief from Jesus' closest followers. And sometimes that can be discouraging. Um, sometimes we can kind of get confused with that, and that's not really something that we would think that would happen, right? That Jesus' closest followers should have known that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, right? We see that in evidence in earlier Scripture throughout the Gospels, that Jesus spoke about His death and resurrection. Uh, and it kind of it, it can be discouraging, right? That when we see that there's skepticism and doubt and unbelief, 
Um, and sometimes when we apply that to our lives, is sometimes when we come in, in, in contact with unbelievers, uh, we see the same thing, right? That we see skepticism and doubt of Christianity. Uh, we see unbelief. And sometimes we get defenseful and, and, and mad um, at that. And really, when we look at the Gospels, we, we, should, we should be excited. Because what, what, what starts as skepticism and unbelief um, and doubt from, from Jesus' closest disciples and followers, it soon turns into a radical transformation uh, to the fact that the disciples were utterly convinced of the proof of the physical resurrection of Jesus, and their lives were completely transformed. So that should give us optimism and hope as believers that, that our God is bigger than somebody's unbelief, our God's bigger than somebody's doubt, um, and skepticism, and we should be excited to, to meet unbelievers with skepticism and doubt for the, for the uh, pure fact that our God is bigger than their un unbelief and their skepticism. So I just wanted to lay those foundations down first. Um, the main point there in the lesson, I'm, I'm going to follow along with our curriculum. Um, Peggy and, and Brenda have emailed us those curriculum, so if you have that, I'll give you the opportunity to, uh, to pull that up. But the main point there says the resurrection is true and calls us to turn our lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12 is what we'll be going through. Um, in the introduction, it has a few questions there that are important questions for us to be able to apply um, what we're going to read about this morning to our lives. And that first question says, What are some reasons people are skeptical about the truth claims that Christianity makes? Uh, what are some reasons uh, of why people are skeptic or skeptical of, of Christianity? Um, you know, for me, really, whenever I was a, a younger, I guess I would say an immature believer, um, the, the biggest doubt I had was, can Scripture be true? Can all of Scripture be true? And wasn't it, you know, I had this misconception in my, in my head, and maybe I didn't ever express it out loud, but... but the, the Bible can't be completely true. Or maybe a group of men, a council, came together and created the Bible all at once. Um, and looking back at that now, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, as you read Scripture, you begin to see the different styles of writing from the different men that wrote these books and understand that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit um, and that all of God's Word is composed by God, right? Um, that was one of my skepticisms, is the Bible couldn't be true. Uh, another one is um, you know, Jesus isn't the only way to salvation, right? That that's a skepticism we see more and more today is that Jesus isn't the only way to salvation, that I can do it my way or I can follow another God. And yes, Jesus is good and he was a prophet. Uh, and yes, maybe even he, he, he was, you know, he did rise from the dead, but there's other ways to salvation. That, that's a skepticism we see today, right? Um, how about uh, a loving God couldn't send anybody to hell? Um, that's a, a, a skepticism that I've faced and, and just having conversation with, with other men uh, in life and in the workplace is that God couldn't send me to hell. Um, that, that, that the truths of the Bible aren't always true. Um, but the reality of that question is, is that we do face skepticism, right? We face doubt and unbelief uh, from non-believers today as we, we work um, in our community. Our neighbors even have that skepticism and doubt. Um, and Really, the question, the second question in that introduction there says, when we meet people who are skeptical or disbelieve all or parts of Christianity, should that give us cause to be timid or fearful? Why or why not? So when we meet people who are skepticism or have skepticism or, or disbelief of Christianity, should that cause us to be timid or fearful? Uh, I think the the easy answer to that, right, that if we were in Sunday school class, we would say uh, absolutely not, right? That we would say, uh, of course, we shouldn't be timid or fearful. But the reality of it is, is sometimes we, um, sometimes we do get scared. Sometimes we get timid when we come in contact and, and, and meet people that, that have doubts and unbeliefs um, of Christians and, and, and what we believe in, right? Um, that, that's the reality of it, um, that sometimes it's, it's kind of fearful for us to talk to, uh, about our faith. Maybe we have the, the, the notion or the thought process that, that we don't have enough knowledge of who God is or we don't have enough knowledge of, of Scripture to, to defend our faith. Uh, but, but like I said already, is that we need to have a, a, a faith that God is bigger than somebody's unbelief 
uh, and skepticism about Christianity, that God was bigger uh, than the disciples' fear and doubt, right, uh, that Jesus truly rose from the dead. At first, they didn't have that belief, and we're going to see that in Luke chapter 24 this morning, is that there was skepticism and doubt from Jesus' closest followers, yet God is bigger than that, and God is bigger than people's uh, uh skepticism um, and, and we should we should be excited about that and we shouldn't be fearful uh, maybe we should allow this time to reflect on our faith with God and say maybe I need to strengthen my relationship with God so that I'm not fearful and I'm not timid uh, maybe I need to get into God's word so I can strengthen my relationship and have the knowledge of who God is and, and the loving essence of God um, so the reality is sometimes we get fearful and timid um, but we shouldn't we should be excited and joyful um, so looking at that introduction commentary there, it says, Easter is about the truth of the resurrection, the guiding belief of Christianity that Jesus, after being dead for three days, rose from the grave in victory over sin and death. As followers of Jesus, we come to this day filled with celebration and hope in the promises of God. Yet for many, this day produces a great deal of skepticism. We hold to the belief that the scriptures are the true and unfailing account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We trust in the message the Bible proclaims. The skepticism of others should not lead us into fear or disbelief, but into a greater appreciation for the gospel that has changed everything about our lives. Uh, just one thing I wanted to point out there in that commentary there is, is we hold to the belief that the Scriptures are the true and unfailing account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, we can have all the head knowledge um, that we, we can pile together through the evidence and proofs, proofs of the resurrection. We can, we can have all the head knowledge of the resurrection, but that doesn't give us salvation. It's faith in Jesus Christ that He truly did rise from the dead, that He truly did sacrifice Himself for our sins. And it comes down to faith in Christ, not a head knowledge. Um, and we hold to the belief that the Scriptures are true, right? Jesus even spoke to that in John chapter 20 uh, on the, with the account of Thomas, right? That, that Thomas places his hands on Jesus' physical resurrected body. Uh, and, and Thomas says, you are Lord, right? Jesus, you are Lord, uh, and Jesus responds to him as, Blessed are they who have not seen, and yet they believe. That's what salvation comes through. Not a head knowledge of the resurrection, not a head knowledge of, of the Bible, but a faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior in our life. So I just wanted to point that out, um, that we have to have a faith that Scripture is true, and it's the unfailing account of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ is the essential uh, part of our salvation, that He was that He was crucified, that He was buried, um, and that on the third day He rose again. So um, I just want to uh, really look at Scripture now. We're going to read uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12 at once, um, and then I'll kind of go back and talk about um, uh, Luke chapter 24, and then we'll ask some questions about how to apply this to our life and, and how do we apply the resurrection to our lives in, in everyday life. So um, if you want to follow along with me, it's Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the leaven and to all the rest. Now is Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveled at what had happened. So this is the account of, of Luke's recording 
of the resurrection, right? The first day of the week where the women come to the tomb and see the stone rolled away. Uh, and just let's just go back and kind of go through Luke chapter 24 and, and really break this down so we can get a good understanding of what's going on. It says, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Who's they? Um, really, if you backtrack into Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 55, it, it gives this account. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. This is the account in Luke chapter 23 of Joseph of Arimathea um, taking Jesus' body and placing it in a tomb that he had bought that no other body had ever been placed in. Um, and each one of the gospel accounts, or, or three of the four gospel accounts, record the women following Joseph of Arimathea and watching him place Jesus' body in the tomb. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, um, some of the other gospel accounts record some other women's, Clopas, uh, um, some of the other women there. Um, so that's what it's talking about when they went to the tomb, the women who had followed Jesus from Galilee. It says, but on the first day of the week, which would be our Sunday, the Jews didn't uh, really have a name for their days of the week. They, they, they followed along with it, really God's creation of, of the heavens and the earth, right? And on the seventh day, which was the Sabbath, He rested. Um, that would be our Saturday. Um, and on the first day of the week would have been Sunday. So it says, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, each one of the gospel accounts uh, places the women arriving to the empty tomb at early dawn or just after dawn or right before dawn. It, it all places the women there um, at, at dawn, uh, right around dawn. And it's just a testimony that the eyewitness accounts and the, and the recordings of the gospel are accurate and true. And it says, taking the spices they had prepared, uh, they, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They knew the stone had been placed in front of the tomb uh, from Luke chapter 23 and the other uh, accounts that they watched Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus was there as well. Um, they watched them place the stone in front of the tomb. Um, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Just a quick side note here is that, that something interesting is, is Luke rarely uh, records Jesus or calls Jesus uh, Lord Jesus up into this point in the Gospel of Luke. As you usually see him referring to Jesus as Jesus. But here, a hint of the resurrection, right? That uh, Luke records him as the body of the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 2, Peter speaks of, of God raising Jesus from the dead. And then a few verses later, he says, and made him Lord, Lord Jesus, right? That he is Lord because he has rose and uh, conquered death and he is our Lord. Uh, it's just a neat uh, side note there. And it says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, they bowed their, and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> uh, don't we oftentimes do that? Um, as Christians today, we may pray uh, to God as Jesus is just a historical figure, right, that lived 2,000 years ago, and He's not alive and present for us now. Why do you seek the living among the dead? We need to be assured and have confidence that our Savior is alive today, and He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, really, 1 John chapter uh, 1 and 2 speak that, that, that Jesus is our defender and our advocate who speaks to the Father in our defense. We don't have a, a Savior that's dead, but that one that is risen from the dead, right? And this is what the angels say to the women. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how He told you while He was still in Galilee the, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Uh, really, if you start looking into Luke chapter 8 and, and forward, you begin seeing Jesus speak about uh, His death and resurrection, uh, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered His words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these things seemed to them an idle tell, and they did not believe them. <laughs> Uh, like, I've, like I've already talked about, is, is shouldn't the disciples have known that Jesus was going to rise from the dead? Shouldn't they have believed the women, right? The women had just received divine revelation from God through angels, and the women would have known these were angels. They would have known of the Old Testament accounts uh, that angels appeared to men 
in the Old Testament and, and women in the Old Testament. Um, and, and yet the, the disciples, Jesus' closest followers, didn't believe these things. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Uh, verses 12 uh, there is, is really John's account of the resurrection is, is Peter and John rose and ran to the tomb. John gets there first and Peter ri- and runs into the tomb. Uh, and this is the account where it says John believed that John compiled all the evidences of the resurrection and he remembered Jesus speaking of the resurrection and John, re- uh, John believed. Uh, that's all it took for John to believe in the resurrection. But Peter went home and marveled at, at what had happened. This is uh, Luke's account of the resurrection. And like I said, it's, it's full of uh, confusion, uh, feel, full of chaos and, and unbelief and skepticism. It's not what we would uh, imagine uh, uh, to think of, of Jesus' closest followers um, um, having unbelief of the resurrection, right? Shouldn't they have known? Um, that's what, that's kind of what comes to mind as you read Luke chapter 24. Um, so we're going to kind of ask some questions with the, uh, the curriculum of the Sunday School lesson. Um, and then we'll go back um, and, and just talk about how we can apply this to our lives. Um, it, it, the first question there says, read John chapter 20, verse 19. Um, if Jesus could, in his resurrection body, pass through a locked door, why in every gospel account is the stone rolled away? Uh, what does this teach us about Jesus? Uh, John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Um, So it says again, If Jesus could, in his resurrection body, pass through a locked door, why in every gospel account is the stone rolled away? What does this teach us about Jesus? Um, you know, I think the conclusion we can all come to um, on this, this question and uh, really something, it, it may be a Sunday school cl- uh, class answer that we're, when we're confident around other believers, we may answer this. And this is a, a correct way to answer it is that Jesus didn't need somebody to roll away the stone, right? That, that the creator of the universe doesn't need somebody to help him get out of a tomb, right? After he's rose from the dead. Uh, that, 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 that's the obvious answer, right? That, that we can come to the conclusion that the stone was rolled away by the angel um, for eyewitness accounts to come into the tomb and see the empty tomb, right? That Jesus was no longer dead, that his linen cloths were laying there in perfect a place, um, that Jesus didn't need somebody to help him get out of the, the empty tomb or to get out of the tomb. Um, that's, that's the obvious answer, right? The, the, the clear conclusion of what we can come to there. Um, but more importantly is, is how do we apply that to our lives? And, and what does this teach us about Jesus is the more important question. Um, and, and it's a good question to ask. And how do we apply this to our lives? And what does this mean for us? Um, and really, it's, it's a deep question. Uh, in, in a practical sense, is it really goes to the, to the great extent to show that God loves us and that God cares for us, that He didn't just create us and leave us for our own devices. He didn't just raise Jesus from the dead and, and, and Jesus ascend to heaven without any evidence or proof that He physically did rise from the dead. Um, but it, it shows us that, the, that God goes to the great extents. Uh, to call those who are in darkness into His wonderful light. I'm using a reference there from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where it talks about how we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people, uh, so that we may declare the wonderful praises of who God is because He's called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. Um, that God goes to great extents to prove that He truly is God. And this is kind of where I was talking about the beginning of the lesson, is that we shouldn't be fearful or timid that when we face a skepticism or unbelief from, from unbelievers, that we should be excited, um, that God truly does uh, call us out of darkness into this wonderful light. Um, and this is just as one of the evidences of that, that God didn't just uh, raise Jesus from the dead and Jesus ascend to heaven, um, that the stone was rolled away so there would be men and women that could come in and look at the empty tomb. And it shows God's love, I think. Um, I really believe that. Um, and, and I'm not saying that God calls some out of darkness and others not. God calls all of us out of darkness. Um, it's those who accept 
that coal um, and, and believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Um, so really, what does that teach us about Jesus? It teaches us a lot. It teaches us that Jesus loves us, that He cares for us, um, and that, that if somebody's truly seeking Him, He goes to great extents to show and prove Himself as Lord and Savior. Um, so that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I love that question and how, how it was asked. Um, kind of moving forward, um, we're, we're going to skip through a few questions there, but it says, why is it significant that the resurrection uh, was discovered by women first? Um, how does this detail lend to the veracity of the resurrection? Um, it's hugely significant that the resurrection was uh, discovered by women first. Uh, the Sunday school lesson, the curriculum, and, and the commentary really point to the fact, and I, I agree with it, but I, I think it goes deeper than what... Uh, even the commentary speaks of is that at this time in history women couldn't even testify in, in court and be uh, held to the standard of an eyewitness they didn't have uh, uh, the, the Greeks and Romans didn't hold them to a value where they could even testify in court and be an eyewitness account um, and, and women just were uh, were not held to the same uh, on the same platform as men um, that was that was the you know what the commentary says there in the Sunday school lesson and that's true um, that's one of the reasons uh, but I think it goes even deeper than that uh, really is is um, obviously is, is Jesus didn't view women on that same level right that they he, he didn't place them in the same society as what what the society t uh, had placed the women at that time uh, you can reference you know John chapter 1 uh, where it sp speaks of uh, that, that God gives salvation to those who believe in Jesus, right? And, and not by a uh, human will or a husband's decision, that God offers salvation to, to men and women, to the Jew and to the Gentile, right? That God offers salvation to all. Um, and it's not made from a decision of a man or uh, the, the men don't get to make the decisions for the women. Uh, the women don't make the decisions for the men on salvation. We all place uh, and get to play a part in our own salvation by placing faith in Christ. Um, but it even goes deeper than that um, is, is really what I believe um, is why the women were the first to discover the empty tomb um, is because um, of the, the testimony of what we see in Scripture, right? That a, that a testimony it has to be accredited by, by two or more witnesses, right? That a, that a word must be upheld by two or more witnesses. Um, in each one of the Gospel accounts, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that it wasn't the, the men there at Jesus' crucifixion, right? That it was the women that were the eyewitness accounts of the crucifixion. The only disciple that were there at Jesus' crucifixion was John. Um, that it was the women that stayed and watched the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Uh, that's in Matthew uh, chapter 27. That's in Mark chapter 15. In Luke chapter 23. Uh, in John chapter 19. That they were the eyewitnesses uh, of Jesus' death. They were the eyewitnesses of Jesus' burial, right? We talked about that in Luke chapter 23 verse 55. That they saw Jesus' uh, dead body being placed into a tomb. Um, and, and then they're the eyewitness accounts of the resurrection, right? You have no resurrection without a burial, and you have no burial without a, without a, a death of the crucifixion. So really, uh, why is it significant that the resurrection was discovered by women first? It upholds the testimony that the, and, and, it, and it lends to the veracity of the resurrection, that it was the eyewitness accounts who saw Jesus' uh, crucifixion and death. It was the eyewitnesses of the women who, who saw the burial, and it was the women who were the first to discover the empty tomb. It was the women that first saw Jesus' physical resurrected body. Um, and, it, and it lends to the veracity of the resurrection. And, and, and it hugely lends to the veracity of the resurrection. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, it says, with God, some questions we have in this life will only be answered in the life to come. But all the big truths about Christianity are plain, verifiable, and disclosed with clarity in God's Word. Jesus, Jesus appeared to a group of people. The message of early Christians was that Jesus is alive. We all saw Him. Christianity is based on the experience of a community, not the experience of a single individual. Another reason the resurrection can't simply be a can't be simply a cleverly devised myth is because the first witnesses in every gospel account were women. Women had no standing in first century Greek and Roman cultures. They couldn't even testify in court. 
If you were making a myth in the early first century, you would have never included women as your first eyewitnesses. Um, just something real quick there, um, I agree with that completely, is that Christianity is based on the experience of a community, not the experience of a single individual. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you see Paul really defending the, the fact that Christ was, was crucified, that He was buried, and on the third day He rose again. And then He goes to, to speak that, that Jesus appeared to, 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 uh, to Peter and then some of the other disciples. And then He really kind of focals and, and highlights that defense is that Jesus appeared to over 500 of the brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Really, Paul uh, dares the readers. He almost dares the readers in, in 1 Corinthians uh, to go out and seek the eyewitness accounts of Jesus for themselves. There's not just one eyewitness account of Jesus' resurrection. There's not just two or a few. He said there was over 500 of the brothers who see who saw Jesus is resurrected, uh, resurrected from the dead at once. And he almost dares the readers to go out and seek for themselves, right? Our, our faith is not based on one man's account. Uh, we see that in some other false religions, right? That, it, that it's just a single person's experience that they have um, that, that they create a false religion out of. That's not what Christianity is. It's a, it's a, it's a testimony of multiple eyewitnesses accounts of Jesus truly physically rising from the dead, right? Um, and it's, it's just important for us to understand that, that we have evidences of the resurrection. Um, the next question there says, how would you describe the lives of the earliest disciples after the resurrection? How did the resurrection transform their lives? Um, completely and utterly transformed, right? Um, how would you describe the lives of the earliest disciples after the resurrection? Um, you, you see it, what, what I've already talked about a lot about is you see it going from unbelief to this complete and radical transformation of the disciples' life, right? They, they go on and they cannot deny that they saw the physical resurrected body of Jesus Christ, that they saw Him alive and that He is Savior, right? He is who He says He is. Um, there's no other way to answer that question than completely and utterly transformed um, in the fact that they saw the resurrected body of Jesus Christ and that He is Lord. Um, how did the resurrection transform their lives? Um, you, you read the New Testament, um, and, and almost every book is written by a disciple that saw Jesus, including Paul. Um, that, that he saw Jesus' body, or that saw Jesus on the road to Damascus even, right? And, and these men were, he was a persecutor. Um, I, I look at really something that's a huge part of my own testimony in 1 Timothy chapter 1 where Paul says that I was a persecutor and a blasphemer and a violent man and yet Christ still came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And he did this so that others may believe upon him. Um, and it, it just it speaks to how the resurrection transforms us and it speaks to how the resurrection transformed the early disciples' life. Uh, it completely and radically transformed their lives. Um, moving on there, it says, Why should the resurrection matter to you? <laughs> we really, really discussed that, right? That it, that's, it's... It should matter to us because it's, it, it has everything to do with our salvation, right? That if Christ didn't rise from the dead, neither will we. We have no salvation apart from the resurrection. Um, and secondly, on the, the second end of that question is, how is the resurrection the ultimate proof that God has the desire and the power to make all things new? Um, that's a tough question to answer. Um, but... You know, I really, you know, I don't think that we that I have the time to to really go into to great detail on how to answer that. Um, and maybe I don't even know how to to, to 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 have that come out and answer that question the way I want to. But really, if you read Scripture from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, Revelation, um, you really see the ultimate proof that God has the the desire. Uh, and the power to make all things new. And it really, it, it just, everything points to Christ and the resurrection. Um, I, I look at, you know, even whenever you see the, the, the first Passover, right, where God accepts uh, the Hebrew sacrifice of the Passover lamb. He places blood over the, the doorpost. Um, and he accepts their sacrifice by, by sparing their firstborn. Um, and then you look to Jesus, who's the ultimate Passover lamb, right? And God accepts 
Jesus' sacrifice by bringing them back to, to life, right? That, that Jesus conquered death, and that's evidence that, that, that God accepts His sacrifice, is that, that He didn't stay dead, right? That He rose from the dead, that God rose Him from the dead. Um, and that's, that's really ultimate proof that, that God does desire uh, uh, to make all things new. Um, Hebrews is an amazing book um, uh, of the testimony that God does uh, accept Christ's sacrifice. I, w- I would point you to uh, Hebrews chapter 1, all or really probably all the way through Hebrews, uh, the, the entire book. But Hebrews chapter um, uh, 10, I believe, um, it, it just speaks of, uh, or Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, it really speaks of that day after day and year after year, the Israelites would sacrifice the, the, the blood of bulls and goats, but, but uh, Christ was sacrificed once and for all, right? That, that God accepted His sacrifice, that He didn't have to continually be sacrificed, that He sacrificed once, and He sacrificed Himself once um, for, for, for our sins. Um, and that God accepted him, that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, that he's the ultimate high priest. Um, you know, Amber really pointed to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 5 and uh, verses 18 and 21, um, and how God has reconciled us, uh, that he has created us and made us a new creation. Um, that's, that's proof that God desires to make us new, and he has the power to make all things new, right? Uh, we see that completely. Uh, we see it in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Ezekiel chapter uh, 37. Uh, I really see, you know, that in, 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 in an Old Testament reference where uh, God talks about, you know, turning our hearts of stone into, into new hearts and placing a living spirit within us. Um, that's uh, proof that God has the desire and the power to make all things new um, and to, to make us a new creation. Um, so, um, that's a, that's a tough question to answer, um, but it's a good question. It's something that we need to look at and reflect at and say, does God make us new? And it's the, the absolute que- the answer is absolutely yes. Um, just a couple more questions there. I know I went through uh, uh, and kind of skipped over some of them, but how do we apply this to our lives? Uh, and, and how do we apply Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, uh, to our everyday lives? Um, and and the, the applica- application questions there, um, I want to read a couple of them. It says, One of the greatest evidences of the resurrection is a life changed by its message. How has the resurrection changed your life? Um, that is the greatest evidence, I believe, of the resurrection. Um, we have the proofs um, through the, the, the um, testimonies of the eyewitness accounts in, in, um, in, the all, in, in three of the Gospels and in Luke's account of the Gospel as well, right? We, we have the evidences of those, the physical evidences and the proofs of that. Uh, but one of the greatest evidences is, is a life changed and a life transformed by its message. Um, how has the resurrection changed your life? I think we need to be able to uh, speak about that as, uh, as, as believers. We need to be able to tell unbelievers about how the resurrection has tra- transformed our lives and how Christ has made us new. Um, and I know for me, um, <laughs> he's complete, Christ has completely changed my, my life. The resurrection has completely transformed me <laughs> from this, this punk, this arrogant, <laughs> this arrogant, cocky little punk to a... Uh, to a, really a, a man who loves God and, and, and seeks God um, and, and not my own uh, attention uh, or, or, or my own power. I don't know how to really get that out, but, but God has completely uh, transformed me from this cocky, arrogant uh, little punk to, to, a, to a, a, a loving man who seeks God. Um, and and I, that's the greatest evidence of, of the resurrection in my life. Um, and I think you should be able to answer that um, individually um, and, and if you if you can't answer that individually maybe it's time for uh, you to reflect and say you know Lord how have you transformed my life um, through the resurrection and the last question I want to a- ask is why does why does your belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ compel you to tell others about what you believe um, <laughs> If the resurrection, and I believe it's completely true through the evidences of the Scripture, through the testimony of the Holy Spirit speaking through me, um, it's in speaking to me is is if the resurrection is true, then everything else that Christ spoke about 
is true. I mean, that should compel us to tell others about Jesus, to see the urgency um, to tell others about Jesus Christ, uh, to live a life of faith um, by action and, and being servants and, and having a loving spirit. Um, if the resurrection is true, and I believe it is, um, then, then heaven is real then hell is real, uh, then us loving others and, and, and showing a sacrificial type of love to others is real. Um, and, and we need to do that. We need to be Je- Jesus' hands and feet. Uh, we need to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. Um, if uh, the resurrection is true, and it is, it tells us that everything else in Scripture is true because everything else in Scripture points to the resurrection and it points to Jesus Christ being the creator of the universe, but not only being the creator of the universe, but being our Savior um, and being our defender and our advocate. So everything else He speaks about is true um, and it should compel us to tell others about the urgency of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Um, So those are some uh, application questions. Uh, on how to apply this to our lives. And I think um, oftentimes we read of the resurrection on, on, on uh, Resurrection Sunday, and we think that we can kind of put it in the, the closet for next year, and that's not what um, we need to do. We need to use the resurrection as, as evidence and proof that God goes to great extents to call those out of darkness into His wonderful light so that we may declare the praises of Him. Um, and we need to use the resurrection to understand that, that it's okay to have skepticism and doubt. But it's okay to know that our God is bigger than somebody's skepticism and doubt. So um, I want to pray for us um, as I close out. And I just want to encourage you to, to tell others about the resurrection this weekend, next week, um, and throughout the year. And to share your testimony about how the resurrection of Jesus Christ um, has transformed your life. Um, Lord, we thank you so much. Um, for giving us Scripture uh, that speaks of the, 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 the physical evidences and proofs of the resurrection, um, that each one of the gospel accounts testifies of that, um, that there was an empty tomb, that Jesus, uh, you physically appeared um, after your resurrection, that you're a God that loves us. I pray that, Lord, you're glorified even in our weaknesses, Father. So, so oftentimes we think that our weaknesses... Um, overpower our testimony and who you are. And that's completely um, the opposite, Father, that oftentimes you're glorified through our weaknesses, Father. And I pray that you're glorified um, in my weaknesses and all of our weaknesses, Lord, through the fact that we're still going to share the gospel with others, no matter um, how uh, uh, fearful it is, no matter uh, how nervous we get, we're still going to spread the good news of you, Jesus Christ, to the world. And I pray that's what we do. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.